Good morning. Um, what I'm going to present today is something of a history lesson, uh, and a history lesson that I hope uh, emphasizes the importance of good research. Um, my good friend Barry Sherman this morning in his paper said, um, after all, what we're dealing with is not rocket science. And it isn't. It's much more complicated than rocket science. Um, and so I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, driver education, driver training, one of the pillars uh, of vehicle and highway safety countermeasures, and what we can learn from it. So, how do I move this one? Right. So, formal driver education had very early beginnings. Um, as you see here, the British School of Motoring uh, was founded in 1910, and it was uh, likely created to teach adults how to drive, and at the time when it was formed, crash risks were not a serious problem. Uh, in fact, there weren't any statistics available from the UK until uh, about 1926. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Driver licensing is closely related to driver education, and driver licensing was introduced for formal driver education. Uh, in 1904, the United Kingdom required driver licenses, and they said you had to be at least 17. Uh, in the United States, uh, we got driver licensing a little later, but we had much younger ages for our beginning drivers. Uh, it varied from state to state, but you could get a license as young as 14 in some states, and in only one state, New Jersey, uh, made you wait until 17. And other countries like Canada and New Zealand also had very low minimum ages for driver license, licenses. And this was all happening when motor vehicle production around the world was increasing rapidly, and especially in the United States. So we were the first country to really motorize and the first country to experience all the problems that we know are associated with motorization. As motor vehicle production grew, so did crash deaths and injuries. So here's a chart from the United States looking at annual motor vehicle crash deaths from 1900 to 2016. And you can see that by 1930, the U.S. was experiencing about 30,000 fatal crashes. And through the early and mid-60s, all of the countermeasures aimed at this problem were based on what we call, or what I call, folklore. Folklore in English means that you follow a set of beliefs that are handed down from generation to generation. That's the folklore. It's past conventional wisdom. But you don't have to validate it. You just believe it because it's folklore. And it wasn't until the 1960s and around 1970 when we started to get science into vehicle and highway safety. So one of the factors that changes things around, and you see this uh, change in the curve that is here, um, around 1970, even though GDP was going up, cra traffic crashes, fatal crash deaths uh, started decreasing. Because, and I believe this is the reason, we started to get science into this field and we started to develop scientific countermeasures. And as I said before, by 1930, we had more than 30,000 deaths in the United States. And the countermeasures were based on conventional wisdom. They were not based on science. And there was a predominant approach everywhere that had lots of motor vehicles. We had to educate drivers to prevent crashes. For the longest time, very few people thought of anything beyond educating drivers as a countermeasure to this problem. And it's not clear when the high crash risk for teenage drivers were first recognized because for the longest time there was only anecdotal evidence there was not very good data. In fact, in the United States, we didn't have good data until the mid-1970s. Uh, the data prior to the mid-1970s was very poor, particularly if you wanted to use it for research. But again, the, the approach that was adopted in the United States 
was driver education, especially for beginning drivers, beginning teenage drivers, it became the approach to preventing crash deaths and injuries in the U.S. Now I'm jumping forward to now where we got good data because clearly there was a problem and there still is a problem with young drivers. This chart shows passenger vehicle driver crash rates per mile traveled by driver age for the year 2008. Uh, it's based on uh, fatality data collected by the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation and driver surveys, use surveys conducted by the Federal Highway Administration. And you can see that for both police reported crashes per million miles and fatal crashes per hundred million miles, we have a cry high rate for our youngest drivers. Uh, it drops and look is at its lowest level for people in their middle age uh, and it jumps up again uh, for people in their 70s and 80s. Uh, there are two different factors at work here for the U-shaped curve. Uh, the young people, the problem there is both immaturity and inexperience. For our older drivers, it's difficulty handling complicated traffic environments. And as we get older, we become more fragile and we suffer injuries and die from injuries that young people uh, that are not serious for young people. But we now go back to 1932 when the countermeasure in the United States for young drivers was adopted. Adopted with no evidence, but uh, the idea was that we would have high school driver education. We would teach students in their final years in high school how to learn to drive. Not only would we teach them how to drive, this would be the only way they could become safe drivers. That was asserted with no evidence. And in fact, uh, there were many very poor studies that were conducted over the years to show how effective these courses were. And it got to be such an important component of our countermeasures that by the 1960s, in most states, you had to complete a high school driver education course before you could obtain your first license. The problems with first studies were that they were incompetent. They, did, they were simple comparisons of the crash records of students who completed courses with those who did not. Enrollment in the courses was voluntary. And later research beginning in the 1960s showed quite clearly that the groups of students who took the courses were different in many respects than the students who did not. And that those differences were related to driving. They included differences in socioeconomic status, gender, social adjustment, academic performance, and intelligence. But for the longest time, there was no attempt to ever adjust for the differences between the two groups. So we had very poor studies, but people believed them, and so the, the importance of driver education in high school uh, was widely believed. We didn't conduct any scientific studies on high school driver education until the late 1960s. He started off with so-called quasi-experimental designs that attempted to adjust for the pre-existing differences between the trained and untrained students and adjusting for them. But often the, the data on these differences were inadequate and group er errors were still possible. The ideal design for this kind of problem or this kind of issue are randomized control trials in which assignment to the trained and untrained groups is random. This is not simple because you have to figure out how to get an untrained group without biases. But it can be done. But we also know that very large sample sizes are needed to detect differences. And as a result, these studies become very expensive. In fact, there have only been two randomized control studies of high school driver education with large sample sizes. The first was in the mid-1970s in England with 1,800 students, and it was designed to assess the very first formal driver education programs offered in English schools. 
They had not been doing driver education as we had been doing in the United States for a long time. They used a curriculum based on U.S. programs, and it was typical of uh, U.S. high school driver education programs. The study conclusions. There was no evidence that driver education has been successful in reducing the accident rate per mile traveled. And the second conclusion, which I think is very important, because we'll get to it later, the trained group of drivers had more crashes than the untrained group because they more often obtained their driver licenses than the, the untrained group. So driver education was accelerating the decision to drive and get a license. The second randomized control trial was in the U.S. and it was very large. It involved 16,000 students and they were followed for four years. Three different groups. A safe performance curriculum, which was going to be the state-of-the-art program for driver education. A much shorter, minimal program, but it was still driver education. And no formal driver education. As I said before, the students were followed for four years. And the data on the subse subsequent crash rates of these groups were subjected to a number of analyses because it became quite controversial. Um, and there are a number of conclusions. The basic conclusions. After 24 months, there were no statistical differences between the crash rates of the three groups. The untrained group had no more or had no more crashes than the trained groups. And in fact, when you did comparisons starting from the 16th birthday, as opposed to starting the subsequent analysis from the date they signed up for the program, there was a significant increase in crash rates for the very super trained group compared to the control group. And a four year analysis said that basically uh, there were no differences between the controls and train groups uh, in years two through four. So this program, which was really state-of-the-art program, found no differences between being trained with a super driver education course, being trained with a minimal driver education, and being untrained. But just in the UK, the trained groups obtained their licenses sooner than the control group. So we saw again the provision of driver education for high school students accelerated their decision to get on the road and drive. And so as a result, we had more crashes. And in fact, subsequent to that research, there was uh, some decisions in some individual states in the U.S. to remove driver education from the high schools. And when that political decision was studied, it turned out that removing driver education from schools reduced crashes for the same reason that fewer students got their licenses. So we got fewer crashes. And we also know in the United States because we have different licensing ages uh, among the states and one state with a 17 year old minimum age. Uh, what we find is that jurisdictions with 16 as the minimum age have more driver involved crashes at ages 16, 17 and 18 and 19 than the jurisdiction with 17 as a minimum age. And the 17 year olds in the 17 year old minimum age state, New Jersey, do not have appreciably more crashes than 17 year olds in jurisdictions with 16 as the minimum age. So one conclusion from this would be maybe we should have a minimum driver licensing age of 17 and not 16 or 15 as it is in a few states. But there is absolutely no political support for raising minimum driving ages. None whatsoever. So what do we do? We have a serious problem. Young drivers are a serious problem. What do we do to address this problem? The answer seems to be, and there's increasingly evidence that this is so, is to reduce their exposure. 
We can't raise the driving age, minimum driving age, but we can come up with programs that lower some of their high-risk driving situations. So, since about 1987, starting in New Zealand, uh, there has been a program that's spread around the world called Graduated Driver's Licensing. And what we do with this program is delay unrestricted driving by break, break, breaking the licensing process into phases. There's a first phase where you can only drive while you're supervised with an adult in the car. Typically this is six months, sometimes 12 months. So you get your license to 16, which is typical in most states. From 16 to 16 and a half, or from 16 to 17, depending on the state, you can only drive with an adult in the car. Following this, and this is a very important phase, there's an in intermediate phase where you can drive by yourself without an adult, but there are restrictions on when and who you can drive with. And typically there are three restrictions. No nighttime driving, and nighttime driving is defined differently from state to state. There are limits on passengers, and there are very low or zero BAC blood alcohol con concentration thresholds. And at the end of this process, the, lies, the drivers can get their unrestricted license and they can drive without any restrictions. The total process can last anywhere from one, two years to, to a little longer from when you start, depending on how long each of these phases are. New Zealand started this in 1987, and today many jurisdictions, including U.S. states, Canadian provinces, and Australian states have GDL programs. One of the restrictions is nighttime driving, and here's a chart showing, similar to the first chart I showed, shows the passenger vehicle driver fatal crash rates per 100 million miles traveled by driver age and day versus night. And you can see that for all young drivers, um, there's a very high uh, fatal crash rate per 100 million miles traveled during nighttime driving uh, compared to daytime driving. So clearly, for young drivers, driving at night is a high risk scenario, which is why we have nighttime restrictions. Another really important risk factor for young drivers is how many passengers are in the car with them. And this shows relative risks of fatal crash involvement by driver age and passenger presence. Uh, the blue bar shows the overall risk relative to our low risk group, which is age, drivers age 30 to 59, compared to the risk when there's no passengers or with one or more passengers. You can see in every case that red bar which involves young drivers uh, on the left of the chart driving with one or more passengers in the car with them. And you can see that uh, up through eight, ages 24, there are some significant increased risk when there's a passenger in the car, especially when the passenger is in a car driven by a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old, or 19-year-old. And so hence we have restrictions on passenger presence. Here's another chart showing the risks uh, by uh, passenger presence uh, compared to driver only for 16 year olds, 17 year olds, and 30 to 59 year olds. And again, look at the red bar. If you've got three or more passengers in a car with a 16 year old, the risks go up dramatically. Whereas you look at 30 to 59 year olds, there's not much of an effect, uh, no effect whatsoever from passengers, basically. So, we've seen restrictions, or we have restrictions now, uh, based on uh, driver age for nighttime driving. These started in the U.S. Uh, around the late 19, uh, 1990s, and in the, in the, sorry, in the early 1990s, but I'm showing here um, risks on the percent changes in nighttime driving from 2001, the baseline 2008, 
And the most recent data, which came out just recently uh, for 2001 compared to 2017. And what we can see here quite clearly uh, for 16 and 17 year olds in both comparisons, there's big drops in nighttime driving uh, as a result of these graduated licensing laws and the restrictions that they've imposed. So nighttime driving has been greatly reduced and we know that's a high risk scenario for the young drivers. Here I have uh, recently updated with the 2017 data the passenger vehicle driver crash rates per 100 million miles traveled by driver age and calendar year and you see the baseline we don't have any data uh, prior to 2001 on travel by driver age um, so even though in 2001 we had a number of states with um, restrictions on young drivers um, and those restrictions have become more and more uh, significant and important as we have we gone forward because states have revised their graduated licensing laws and um, toughened for example the nighttime restrictions so instead of starting in some cases where they used to start at midnight they now start at 9 p.m. Uh, but you can see that uh, the crash rates uh, for 2008 and in particular for 2017 for our youngest drivers have dropped quite significantly uh, as a result of these restrictions. So what do we conclude from all of this? Well, we certainly conclude the importance of research because prior to any research, it just was a good thing to train drivers. Let's just train drivers. Uh, can't be bad. It can't do anything wrong. But it did. It did things wrong because uh, they don't reduce crashes. They accelerate the decision of young drivers to get behind the wheel. And the net result is increases in crashes. And it's also clear, not just from this research, but from other research, that people of all ages who voluntarily choose to take formal driver education courses will have differences that are related to driving, driving from those who do not. So it's very important uh, to make sure you adjust for these differences when you're studying these effects. But my bottom paragraph there is key. Driver education was adopted in the US decades before it was scientifically evaluated. By the time it was evaluated, there was a large community of teachers, and they, those teachers had trade associations, with a vested interest in continuing this program. Even though the research has shown that the programs are on balance harmful, these groups that now exist are still very strong. Their influence is very strong. In fact, in a few states and uh, some other countries, They've successfully lobbied uh, that you can get people um, exempted from some of the, or shorten some of the restriction, period, restriction periods if you've completed a driver education course, which of course is counterindicated by all research. So my bottom line is research is important. It's more difficult than rocket science because it is complicated. A lot of these issues are complicated. But it's very important not to adopt countermeasures without scientific evaluations and certainly not let them continue for decades without any evaluations because by that time you will have a community that is a vested interest uh, in prolonging uh, programs that ultimately may be harmful. Thank you very much.